Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Doug, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you tonight about a lot of the exciting activities we have going on with the city of Minneapolis and um, what we're really trying to do with climate change. Um, many of you know that the city of Minneapolis has a lot of very aggressive goals in regards to climate change and reducing our carbon footprint, increasing our use of renewable uh, energy, increasing our local food supply and, and access to local food, and addressing literally uh, hundreds of years of, of environmental justice. So this is a very broad at, uh, overview of what some of the activities that we are doing. Um, the city of Minneapolis is very well known, both nationally and uh, internationally. We are one of the founding members of the Climate Neutral Cities Alliance, which uh, is inaugurating its newest member uh, this uh, May in Helsinki, so Helsinki, Finland. So we are in uh, a company with some of the leading cities around the world, including Tokyo and Sydney, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Oslo, Copenhagen, Oh, of course, all the great uh, uh, Stockholm and Helsinki, the, the Nordic countries, but London, Paris, and many others, uh, including Toronto and Seattle, San Francisco, across the country that are really setting very aggressive goals to reduce carbon. And all of those cities have either set goals for uh, carbon neutrality or at least reducing their carbon uh, emissions by 80% by 2050. I think actually we have the ability to do that more quickly. We are uh, in a situation where we have the technology and we have the knowledge to be able to do a reduction of our carbon more quickly and we have, as you'll see in just a minute, been uh, overachieving for our particular goals. And as the director of the sustainability, I'm working very hard on, on every day to make sure that our city is doing everything it can to uh, address climate change um, uh, from the way that we are, uh, our transportation systems are the way that we are developing housing and affordable housing, the way we're looking at environmental justice, the way that we are looking at building efficiency, the way we're working with utilities. Um, so there's a lot of activities going on and I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of, of all those uh, or many of those activities. So the city of sustainability um, has sort of four broad categories we look at. We look at fo local foods and food systems, climate change and clean energy, and this includes energy efficiency, environmental justice, really trying to make this about economic empowerment as we transition our, our economy to a more sustainable economy. And we're looking at climate resilience. How do we adapt to the shocks that are inevitable with climate change that's going to be happen? Even if we are successful uh, with what we're doing, we will have to have the ability to be more adaptable as you're hearing about floods in, in Illinois and Missouri, things like that, these th kinds of things are happening as we know a lot more frequently. So in the process of becoming more sustainable, how are we becoming more adaptable and how are we becoming more resilient is becoming a very big factor in our efforts on um, uh, sustainability. So our, loot, our local food policy systems, um, we oversee a, a number of different areas, including the Minneapolis Food Council. Um, which looks at local food systems as a broad array of partners and nonprofits. We manage the urban agriculture and community garden lease program. Right now we have over 70 lots um, that have been leased to the community for uh, growing local uh, fruits and vegetables throughout the city. And um, on an annual basis, we go out for uh, an RFP or a uh, request for application for new garden leases from the community. And we got 10 new garden leases this year. Interestingly enough, actually over 200 community gardens are in operation in uh, 2019 in, uh, in the city of Minneapolis. So just the city lots represent less than half of the community garden plots that are going on. This summer we're working with McAllister College in a really great um, survey of who's actually doing all that stuff. We just kind of know about it as much, but we don't know what they're doing and how they're doing it and what the, what, uh, barriers and successes they're having. And then we also oversee the farmers markets. We have 31 farmers markets in the city of Minneapolis representing more than $15 million a year in annual sales and they actually account for uh, supporting about 5,000 jobs throughout the community. The Minneapolis Food uh, Council is one of the oldest sustainability advisory groups made up of community, uh, 19 community members and representatives and as you can see they're really there to enhance the health of all residents protect the earth, increase economic activity and um, connectedness and improve our overall food security. So they do look at food policy. We're looking at 
how we use our land, how we pollinate our habitats, protecting bee and supporting uh, pollinators um, across the city and across the state. Um, so there's a lot of interesting food policy that comes out of that um, group. Um, we do a great um, urban agriculture program. We offer, um, as I mentioned, the leasing of vacant lots for community gardens. We offer a garden in a box program, which includes seeds for vegetables, as well as organic composting that we do uh, in partnership with the, uh, um, uh, the city of Minneapolis, I'm sorry, with the Minneapolis Park System. And we really support food infrastructure, really working with like I say, the farmers markets in different areas to bring local food into our community and also make, uh, address some of the issues of, of uh, uh, urban food deserts and things like that. Um, some interesting stuff I mentioned that the, the food, the farmers markets, um, we're, we are working on a, building a, a broad range coalition with all of our farmers markets to really figure out how we can do joint marketing to be able to um, support them with the use of EBT for low income families. Um, we're looking at assessing what the impacts are. Some of those metrics I mentioned, about $15 million in sales and over supporting over 5,000 jobs throughout the community are things that we came out of our, our um, Minneapolis Farmers Market metrics project which is being supported by the uh, General Mills Foundation. And we do a lot of work around supporting vendor training and supporting folks getting in to the farmer's markets, understanding how you can make money at this, how this can become a real economic um, activity for someone and not just sort of a, a part-time uh, job, though a lot of part-time jobs are supported there. We're really trying to help build up the vendors there and make them as successful as they can. Uh, many of you think about sustainability, and I know with the Renewable Energy Society, that means talking about clean energy and specifically about climate change. This is where we spend a lot of time, um, as you know, with a lot of interesting pieces. Um, the city has a goal of 80% carbon emission reduction by 2050. We have uh, developed one of the, the country's first climate action plans, which have been modified in a couple of different ways since 2013. Um, we just got named, actually, in a national publication in the New York Times today that um, we are an honorable mention for the activities uh, uh, that we do um, with uh, co collaborating through our clean energy partnership with our local utilities. We're the only state in, in the United States that has a clean energy partnership in which we have a, an agreement, a memorandum of understanding about how we will work together. And that agreement says that XL Energy and Centerpoint Energy are going to support the, the goals of the city of Minneapolis, which is our carbon reduction goals. Um, we have a big emphasis of really walking the talk with our municipal operations. Currently, we have a goal to reduce our, our um, uh, energy uh, use by 10% in the next three years. Um, we're also looking at putting solar on all of our uh, municipal facilities, um, and we're really working hard to be as efficient as possible. Um, as you know, we've got a commercial and now residential bu building energy benchmarking initiative, and I'll touch base on a couple of new initiatives too. So this is a chart that shows the, um, where we are at currently. The latest information we have is um, through the end of 2016. And right now we've been able to reduce our carbon emissions from our 2006 baseline by 20.4%. So we're ahead of our projections to reduce by 15% uh, by 2015. We are on target to hit our 2025 projections and I think our residential and commercial benchmark are gonna be, play a big role in that. Um, we will have a long way to go to hit 80%. And that is because when you look at one of the big bars here, let's see if I can, is this the one? Yeah. So this is electricity consumption here. This is natural gas consumption. This is on-road transportation. We've got some solid waste and wastewater. But electricity consumption, we've really been seeing, that's where we've had the major gains. This is really the cleaning up of the grid. Excel has been doing a lot. We've been doing a lot on community solar gardens. You know, we're talking about XL within the city and the metro area is about 25% renewables right now. Our biggest challenge is going to be right here on natural gas because this actually has an opportunity to be uh, decarbonized. The transportation sector, we've, we can see a glide path, we can see a runway forward on, on how we can decarbonize um, transportation over the next couple of uh, decades. But this is uh, our most difficult one is around natural gas. I guess we can take questions in here. <laughs> sure, go ahead. City building, you mean all the residents, or do you just mean city buildings and city vehicles and city-owned 
ever, the entire what we call the community of the city of Minneapolis. You're measuring how much gas and electricity is used. That's correct. You're measuring where you are. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. And it uh, we we don't include the airport, but all the major businesses and, and industries we include, as well as all the households. Jim, yeah. aren't, aren't you switching though from like coal to natural gas to more electrical production? Um. There is some of that going on, um, though it's it's not a it's a very intermediate strategy, um, and there's even been some folks saying that they're unlikely to be a another gas uh, plant electric gas plant built after 2020 in the United States because the cost of the gas plant is very expensive as well too. The cost of renewables are much lower than that, and if we are able to work out things where we get some base load through, you know, uh, a solar or wind plus storage and demand side management, we're going to eliminate the need to have either coal or natural gas plants in the future. So we actually take, we are very active in um, regulatory affairs now that we've brought on. I know some of you may know Stacy Miller, um, who I worked with at the Department of Commerce. She now works as our legislative and policy regulatory person. Um, and we take a pretty aggressive stance on new fossil fuel um, coming online in Excel Energy territory. So we took a position against the purchase of a new Mankato gas or a purchase of an existing Mankato um, Energy Center gas plant um, for that reason. We don't feel that there's a need to be adding additional fossil fuel and that plant is estimated to run through at least 2060 um, and at over 900 megawatts of, of, of uh, energy we feel that that's not the right position that we should be taking. And on top of that, it's costing all of you as ratepayers more money to have that than it does currently. They buy the power from it now, but when they acquire it for the next 15 years, it will actually cost more money than it costs right now. We don't think that's the right direction to go. We've spoken out against it at the PUC. I'm gonna question. Related to that, any actions for the legislative effort to try and create a gas plant in Becker in the mid 20s? Um, that's kind of not a done deal, but um, they were able to get past the public. But has the city taken any steps for the, uh, their opinion about that? No, because we haven't had a comment period directly on that since the time I've gotten on. But we did actually take a position supporting the Google um, data center that they're building, because they're actually offering the Google, uh, Google data center 600 megawatts of 100% re renewable energy on XL Energy property and they've promised them that they can do it at a lower cost than the current rate of electricity. So the comments that we made is like, hey, we're actually one of your biggest customers, the city of Minneapolis, and we'd like to see an offer like that too. <laughs> we want to have lower price and 100% renewable. So we, we've been go talking with them about that, but you know, I, I'm going to mention a few things that are kind of visionary out there that we're trying now to uh, address some of these issues uh, in transportation and here, the, the electricity side of things is actually the, the easiest one to achieve, um, relatively speaking. So here you can see the kind of breakdown um, on this right now. We've got a fairly significant natural gas consumption, which um, interestingly enough, this, that this is very heavy industrial. This is two thirds industrial. So it, even if we're able to sort of decarbonize our home heating systems, there's a lot of dependence on industry on natural gas too. Electricity consumption, obviously, still a pretty big factor, but um, again, if we're able to get to 100% renewable, um, uh, which is very possible, we can decarbonize that. And then the on-road transportation, again, has a, a glide path forward, but um, we'll take some pretty big behavioral changes, and that's one of our big pushes as part of, uh, I'll mention, and part one of our new programs with our Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. So mention the climate action plan adopted in 2013. Basically, this sits on my desk and I look at it every day to see like what is the next thing I'm going to be working on as we look forward into the future. I try to keep out a little bit ahead of things, um, but we are really doing a good job of clicking off a lot of things in there. Um, our clean energy partnership, as I mentioned, was kind of a not part of the clean the, the clean the climate action plan, but it came out of, you may remember, there was a fairly significant pushback in 2014 to municipalize the utilities in the city of Minneapolis. 
The city of Minneapolis does have a municipal utility. It's our water utility. It has all the same authority actually as, as the electric and the gas utilities. We just don't own the infrastructure to transmit gas or transmit electricity. But we do have it. The city does run it. We know how to run it. We do a good job at running it. And so there was a very significant push to get um, to, to, in order to achieve these aggressive climate goals is to municipalize. But obviously there was an agreement worked out and, and you know, for better or worse and, and whose opinion you, know, you take on it. But nonetheless, a good thing did come out of it. And that was an agreement through the um, Clean Energy Agreement to develop on an on a every other year basis a work plan in which all the two utilities in the city of Minneapolis will work together to achieve the city of Minneapolis goals. Not the utility goals, the city of Minneapolis goals. So far we've been doing pretty well in it. It's really kept everybody at the table. I will say that in my first seven months there, um, we've had a couple of come to Jesus sort of <laughs> conversations because I don't think it's being aggressive enough. And this year we're going to be coming out with a report to look at cumulatively what has been the impact of all of those activities that we've done so far and what we are planning to do as far as achieving our goal. It, is, it has some impact, but it is certainly not um, achieving significant enough, in my opinion, um, carbon reduction. So we'll continue working on that. Um, we've got some really great um, uh, community engagement activities going on. We have a staff of seven but we staff a lot of different uh, community meetings. We have the Community Environmental Advisory Commission. It's the oldest environmental um, advisory group uh, uh, in the city of Minneapolis. It was founded in 1986. It has 19 members. Um, they work on a lot of really great things, which you'll see in just a minute. Our Energy Vision Advisory Committee, which is a community-based organization that advises the Clean Energy Partnership and also gives direction on, on how we invest our franchise fee funding and how we set our, our strategies on a two-year rolling basis. Recently, we've started both the Northern Green Zone and the Southern Green Zone, and we'll touch base on those. Those are really groups that are based on residents, and we're really trying to change the way things are done by creating a ground-up initiative with members of two areas of Minneapolis, one in North and one in South that have been severely impacted over the last uh, generations or 100 years or more of uh, environmental impact from you know, uh, air pollution and car pollution and things like that. And we really wanna make sure that we're engaging these folks as we transition the, our, our economy to a cleaner, greener, brighter uh, economy. And then we also have, as I mentioned, our, our Minneapolis Food Council, which works a lot on food policy. So the, the Environmental Advisory Commission has um, a pretty active agenda. These are all of the priorities that they've set so far for 2019. <laughs> um, they will be, they're in two year terms, so they, they're deciding next on like which ones they're gonna start prioritizing and things like that. But a couple of really interesting things that they're gonna be working on is um, uh, they are really focused on sustainable transportation and then also really looking at how we get to 100% renewable electricity, carbon sequestration, and really doing deep energy retrofit on, on buildings as well too. And then I'll mention this a little bit later, but the Upper Harbor Terminal is, I think, our once in a lifetime opportunity to really create a carbon free, um, gas line free, smart city that is going to be engaging, exciting, and really uh, be an example of what a bright uh, carbon-free future really holds and and uh, we're pushing hard to, to help make that happen. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk just briefly about some of the programs so that you have a question? Well, you know, we, we, we did try to move forward with the plastic ban in 2015. Um, we were we were then um, uh, the legislature preempted the city from banning plastics in general, um, which included plastic bags and plastic straws. We actually have been successful in the House this year as part of our legislative agenda, and actually don't go into that a lot, but the legislative agenda, we have actually been successful in the House of overturning the preemption on, on plastics. We have been successful at moving forward an aggressive new stretch code for our energy code, which require 80% lower energy use for new buildings beginning in, in 2020. We've been successful at being able to remove the preemption on um, controlling pesticide 
in um, using pesticides and phosphorus within the, ci in the city. And we've um, uh, been successful at um, pushing back on some things that are like, for example, on community solar gardens and trying to eliminate some of those things. So what we're doing is if we do actually get through the get get the preemption removed, we will be looking at a, a little bit more aggressiveness in regards to the plastic bags. But this ordinance, it will move forward um, e either as this is what we've got right now that we're planning to actually pass in about two months um, after the legislature. <laughs> we learned the last time <laughs> this what this does is says that that, re that retailers will need to charge five cents for either a plastic or a paper bag. Interestingly enough, I don't know if people knew, but pl paper bags actually have a ca higher carbon footprint than a plastic bag because of their weight and how they're made. And the they're, co ops are already doing What's that? The co ops are already doing that. Yeah, and they use, and we're not going to collect the money <laughs> that can be used within um, that retailer to be <laughs> able to either provide reusable bags um, or cloth bags for free, that kind of thing. Anybody that's uh, is using food, food stamps or EBT uh, will not be required to have to pay the extra five cents. Um, but what we're trying to do is make people conscious about a plastic bag. Do you really need to have it? You really don't need to have a plastic bag to put an apple in to put it in your grocery cart. And in many ways, we people are so used not peep that when you check out, it's like two things going to bag next one, two things, you know, Let's be conscious about what we're doing and be aware of that. And that's really important. So this basically says bring your own bag and you won't get charged five cents. Otherwise, there will be a five cent charge on, on the grocery bags. Yeah. Okay, the 80% uh, new construction, can you what, say that again? So there, there's a, a, a program called Sustainable Buildings 2030. And um, it is a program that was started in 2008. It applies to all state funded buildings. We've had over 160 of them built so far, 60 of which are in the, in the uh, city of St. Paul. Um, basically, it requires that any new building, and we haven't set the size, but the minimum size right now that we're looking at is about 25,000 square feet and up, would be required to be uh, built to 80% more efficient than the 2003 building code. So, the, and it creates a glide pathway to carbon neutrality by 2030. Yeah. And uh, are there city building codes or requirements in place that are coming for zero footprint new construction? No, not that it would it would kick in in 2030 if we are able to adopt the SB 2030 stretch code. But um, we, uh, it's, it won't, it's not gonna happen immediately. It has a long run. So it starts at 80% more efficient in 2020, 90% more efficient in 2025, and then 100% or, or carbon neutral by 2030. Thank you. Will not affect single family homes unless you're building over 25,000 square foot no. single family home. <laughs> yeah. Kim, on a block to block basis in the city, is there a vision of how from the organizing level, you're approaching this vision. You mean like does the city have a plan that is to get buy-in and engagement? I'm thinking back to Terry who used to work for the city energy office back when we were first implementing uh, neighborhood energy mm -hmm. workshop and mm -hmm. sort of engaging. Mm -hmm. on a block-to-block -block basis. Mm -hmm. Is there a vision of doing this? Um, we, about, or, or are they just relying on social media? And well, we, 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 uh, we have a lot of programs that we work with other partners on, and one of them is we're working with the Green Teams, which are a coalition of neighborhood organizations. We have a north side and a south side one. And there we come together and talk mm -hmm. about what are the things that are mainly affecting single family homes in that case, but in some cases also smaller um, rental properties. And we're doing engagement directly um, with those organizations. We do a lot of engagement with neighborhood organizations directly. We also have really good representation um, on our Community uh, uh, Environmental Advisory Commission and our Energy Vision Advisory Commission, where we have nonprofits such as Minnesota 3, MN350, um, Sierra Club, a um, couple other ones, 
And so we do a lot of work through those organizations and as well as Center for Energy and the Environment. Okay. Um, that's kind of how we're doing our community engagement at this point. Um, and then we also have direct work that we're doing on a landlord engagement program. Now we've piloted, we've, we're in our second year, and, and we we're focusing on, on landlords who have buildings that have 20 or less units in them, which actually that makes up of the buildings about 80% of the total buildings. So 20% of the buildings are bigger than like 20 units, and they represent a lot more number of units total but the number of smaller apartment buildings, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, things like that, we are doing more direct engagement with um, property owners associations. And we've had a really a lot of success in that. We've gotten in the, in the last year, 45 buildings to, to do energy evaluations. And um, we've gotten uh, 22 of them to actually go forward with the energy efficiency improvements. And that's a big challenge because in most cases, it's kind of an inverse incentive um, to do that because tenants are actually paying the energy costs. So landlords don't necessarily see a direct return on investment from doing more energy efficiency. So there's really been a drag on our ability to get people to do stuff like that. But we've been, we've been really successful with going out and meeting with them and talking directly with them. So we have a full-time um, a person who's working specifically for, with the property owners and managers association of Minneapolis to go out and do that and obviously make connections with the utility programs and things. <clears throat> so a um, couple of like really cool um, uh, community programs, um, green business cost share for businesses. Um, we have done this program for quite a while. Um, it's been around for about four years. We've invested um, about $7 million in energy efficiency. Um, related activities and pollution reduction activities. Um, we have no cost home energy assessments for anyone that lives within the green zone um, and um, anyone that uh, is at 50% or below a very median income. Um, otherwise, they're hundred dollars. We do a lot of sub, uh, we do a lot of investment with uh, the clean energy, um, I'm sorry, the Center for Energy and the Environment. One of the really neat things that we're doing now, which is um, we currently have the zero, oops, Currently have zero percent financing. Um, whoops, hang on, sorry. Well, there we go. We have zero percent financing right now for insulation and air sealing on on homes. We're um, expanding and, and growing the program starting April first. So it will allow for zero percent financing for rooftop solar up to twenty thousand dollars. It will um, be available for super energy efficient um, uh, replacement of equipment in your house, including. Um, putting in a 98% efficient furnace, even though I know that John will look at me and say it's still gas, but we're making baby steps still right now. Incrementally, we're changing. Um, but what that does is we're actually, we've, we've got together with a group of um, contractors um, that are um, basically ha have a relationship with Centerpoint. And we've um, communicated with them about this program. And what we've had in the past is you had to go through an energy audit. So now we're saying you don't have to go through an energy audit, you have to get an energy audit scheduled. But if you have a furnace going out, what we're trying to do is say, we'll give you 0% financing if you do the most efficient furnace that's available in the market right now. We're not saying you gotta electrify the whole house, but we're gonna ask you to move from 92 to 98 or from 90 to 98. And if you do so, we'll get, get you 0% financing. And the reason we're doing that is one, it ties them to having an energy evaluation. It's required now to do it. And two, we immediately give them incentive to go the extra mile to go a little bit more efficient. But the decision can be made right there and then to be able to go ahead and get that, that financing. We still have air sealing and insulation. We are actually doing the only uh, one that isn't rebatable from the utilities is a air source, um, air source water heater. Um, which John, I know you put in one of your in your property too. So we are actually doing that under zero percent um, financing, and a number of other great programs we're doing um, to support it. Yeah. So, so you said zero percent for solar install as well. Yeah, up and, to twenty thousand. And mm -hmm. because you have leverage, you had leverage when we renegotiated with Excel. Mm -hmm. Is Excel? They looked at pulling back the rebates. Are they going to continue the rebates? They're continuing the full-on rebates with it as well, too. So it's still eligible for solar rewards and all the utility-related act activities as well. And then we're going to be rolling out um, June 1st with Centerpoint, an on-bill loan repayment program that's going to leverage $3 million in 0% financing 
in partnership for the Center for Energy and the Environment. So you will be able to get electrical improvements, energy efficiency improvements, as well as gas efficiency improvements put onto your bill and paid back using the 0% loan as well as um, on bill financing that. So that's going to come out June 1st. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the financing as far as plan? Is it 10 years? Um, it is typically will be five years on equipment. Um, it will go up to 10 years on solar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, like the solar financing, who's that going to be through? The city of Minneapolis? No, it's through the Center for Energy and the Environment. CEE. Yeah, CEE. But then how will that be on bill payment? So they're working with, um, so what will happen is that um, Centerpoint will access the capital and then center, uh, from CEE. So CEE is actually the one that brought the $3 million in. We're actually putting in about a half a million dollars from the franchise fee money that ratepayers in Minneapolis pay. We're using that to buy down the cost to zero from about 6% to zero. So we actually aren't putting up the full $3 million in capital. CEE then actually does the whole transaction and then it's all then moved on to the to center point and they will collect the money and then pay the, make the payment to, to um, CEE. And just, and Excel is not involved even though it's electric, it's because center point already has something kind of in place no, we've had to push them really, really hard to, to put it in place. We've been, it's, been, it's been in the making for about a year, and um, they've invested um, quite a bit of money on the new software to be able to do it. It's one of the outcomes of the Clean Energy Partnership's most recent work plan, and our next, this current work plan that we're in now, we just started a new one in 2019, is pursuing an inclusive financing program, which will be available without any credit checks, will be available to all renters, will be, and will, the financing will be tied to the meter rather than the individual. So if you moved, if you got the 0% financing and you, and um, through um, at, uh, Centerpoint, and you moved your house, you'd have to repay that loan. With inclusive financing, it's tied to the meter because you're gonna be getting us energy savings automatically for over the entire time period that you're paying it back. So it's lower cost actual on your bill, but, if someone moves in and this is something for renters to get engaged in, as long as it meets the criteria to reducing overall energy costs and energy use, um, it, it will be tied to the meter rather than tied to an individual, which we hope will then be able to really engage a lot more folks. Yeah, years ago, there was a problem with Excel with renters mm -hmm. because they didn't, um, they'd be in an apartment building, but they weren't on the roof. Mm -hmm. You know, then purpose it to that individual unit was very hard. Mm -hmm. Is that been streamlined? Um, well, we still have to get landlord approval to do it. Um, we're looking at things that like they would potentially be able to do like, you know, folks that are responsible for um, improving like, you know, they have window air conditioners or lighting or baseboard electric heating or things like that. If there's a way that we can go through and get something more efficiently done, and it, it makes economic sense, insulation and things, air sealing. Putting solar on the roof. Not necessarily putting solar on the roof. Yeah, we've kind of, I think community solar gardens have kind of filled that niche now without having to go to the roof. The uh, renter could get a community solar garden subscription, for example. I know you guys got till seven o'clock, um, so I'll just kind of whip through some other stuff here. Um, so, well, I guess we just talk about, you know, <clears throat> a couple of things we've, we've done over the years here. Um, some big stuff, you know, we've got, this is still really doing well. I was just up there last year, Target Center Green Roof, still the second largest green roof in North America. This um, saves the city about $300,000 a year in cooling costs for the Target Center. It also absorbs one and a half million gallons of stormwater a year. Um, so it releases it through evaporation um, rather than going through the storm sewers and stuff. Um, we've actually done $19 million in energy efficiency um, uh, improvements for City Hall and a number of other downtown buildings as well. Um, and we have one of the only uh, LEED Platinum um, public buildings in the country. This is that public works facility on, on Hiawatha. We have a requirement that you at least get LEED Silver for public buildings. On demand side management, mm -hmm. have you considered running the wastewater treatments plants according to what the demand is? I mean, or are you, are you even build uh, premium hours, <coughs> you know? And, mm -hmm. and I would think something like that could be a bit flexible on how much energy you're drawing. Hmm. 
in the middle of the night. Or something. Yeah. Um, uh, it, that wastewater is actually handled by the Metropolitan Council, so we aren't too involved in it, but I can tell you they have a pretty aggressive stance on, on renewable energy. Um, they do have a goal to have their wastewater treatment plants and all their facilities and all of light rail transit all running off of 100% renewable. It's still, well, even demand side management. Right, it's energy. Even on sunny solar days, you could really run it, and right. cloudy mm -hmm. days, you could let it wait, accumulate I, 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 yeah, I, I haven't looked into that. I don't know if they're looking at that aspect or not. Um, certainly can, you know, inquire about it if you'd like and get back to you on it. It seems to me an, uh, a uh, type of management that would... Possibly, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how, you know, that, and you're right. Water, ship, the city actually, 40% of the city's electricity use is spent on moving water around. <laughs> you know, so we have the water plant. Um, some new programs I want to talk about, um, just really quickly. Um, we've got this Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. We have a big focus on doing um, transportation um, changes there. Um, our big goal is to bring a transportation mobility hub with five uh, renewable powered electric uh, mobility options to within a uh, 10 minute walk or a half mile of every resident in the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul in the next five years. Um, we have received considerable funding from the feds already, uh, six and a half million dollars. We are electrifying the entire hour car fleet. We'll be, uh, um, nice ride is coming out with all electric bikes this weekend at the convention center. They're doing a electric bike expo. Cause so nice ride will be bringing electric bikes. Um, and we're going to be, um, we also are in, in um, conversations with Lyft and Uber um, to electrify parts of their fleet for people that are do servicing Minneapolis and St. Paul. And the Minnesota Department of Transportation is committed to doing level three fast chargers at our first 35 um, uh, mobility hubs, of which the charging will be free. So people that have electric cars. 35? 35 between the Minneapolis and St. Paul using Volkswagen money and some other funds as well too. Yeah, so finally we won't have to be searching for the charge point. Where is it? <laughs> and um, this will, this, and you know, we really want to, that is a major, our number one goal with the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. The other really great goal of it is we are um, going to build out a single plat platform application which will be able to bring together those five different transportation options, including, of course, met Metro Transit, Busing, and LRT, on a single payment platform on your phone in which you'll be able to choose what priorities you want and be able to get from point A to point B utilizing the, the um, individual transportation mobility hubs. The really big goal is to, is to reduce um, vehicle miles traveled, and we've had a, one of the big things we, we run into is that when people don't know how to get from the first mile or the last mile, you might have heard this already, they're much less likely to take public transit. If you can get one mile and get to a transportation hub and then go from here to there, um, it's that people are much more likely to do that. Um, so we're trying to reduce the distance and, and the desire that is related to that sort of anxiety about getting from point A to point B in the first mile and last mile. Yes. Um, are you guys working with other cities on this in the area? Um, St. Paul and I, St. Paul and Minneapolis are the two main cities on it. They're also a Bloomberg ACCC and that's their number one gig as well too. But I can tell you we talk a lot with Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, Eden Prairie, Edina, all very progressive. Maplewood, um, Woodbury, Oakdale are also very progressive. Falcon Heights. So I see this as going to be really a, a larger regional strategy but we're starting on it here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. The first one is going to be is going to be under construction um, at Ramp A in um, Minneapolis this summer. Um, so uh, I know we're tight on time, so I'll keep moving on. One of our big things that we did this year, which is related to our commercial benchmarking ordinance, where we have all 455 buildings or so, 417 buildings, um, commercial buildings provide energy. Um, to provide information about their energy and water use to the city of Minneapolis. And um, we have seen some, just because of the fact that they're reporting the energy, we've seen a 3% decrease in energy use since 2015. Just recently, you may have heard that we added a res all residential properties to residential energy benchmarking. There's 
nearly 500 um, multifamily buildings over 50,000 square feet. Um, and then we also have done a time of rent, which is uh, energy disclosure, which means renters will know how much their costs will be on a per square foot basis and be able to compare between different buildings. Part of a behavioral nudging concept that would try to get people to think, landlords to say, well, I don't want to be, I want to be competitive, so I want to have a really energy efficient building and I'll invest in those energy efficiency improvements. And then we're also looking at single family homes for the truth and sale of housing. We will be requiring a sort of energy evaluation light um, that's done to determine insulation and, and um, efficiency measures in there. Um, and that's going to be rolling out in 2020. And uh, that um, <clears throat> will probably affect about four to 6,000 houses a year, which will increase the number of homes going through an energy evaluation by 500%. Yes. Do you have plans to uh, provide incentives or financing for rental properties to put in EV charging? Because a lot of the charging happens at home. Right. Um, we are right now starting the exploration of um, uh, doing charging, um, putting for new buildings anyway of a certain size doing EV charging ready. We'd like to put forward a, an EV charging incentive. This, uh, there was a, a bill that was brought forward in the legislature this year that did pass the House Energy Committee, which would provide money um, for um, incentives for um, property owners and homeowners to put in EV charging stations. The city does not have an incentive right now, though. Well, we're looking at it. Matter of fact, I'm meeting on the 22nd of April with some folks to start talking about how we start getting EV charging stations in downtown. We're starting with condominiums um, where people own their own parking spaces because right now not many condominiums have charging stations. Loring Green and Grant Park have done some, but others have banned it basically saying you can't do it yet because they haven't you know, figured out whether they got the infrastructure to do it. But we want to figure out a way to do that because by 2025, probably half of our cars sold will be EVs. So we need to make that happen. Um, this is an interesting slide. It's a little complicated, but one of our big um, plans that we're doing, also part of Bloomberg and uh, a, a staff direction, is to, to develop a, a blueprint that will get us to 100% community renewable energy by um, 2030. And what this shows is that <clears throat> we need to have about, for the entire community, a total of 3,879 gigawatt hours a year to cover the entire amount that's in there. So this is going to require an all-in strategy. This is actually the part we're talking about energy efficiency. This, was come out of, this came out of a study that said we are able in the next 10 years, um, if we have everything working and firing and, and moving along um, in sync, to reduce our energy use by 31% across the entire city um, through energy efficiency measures. And um, how we get all that done is, is still uh, you know, in the details. But uh, it was a, a, a very interesting thing. This is done with the, the World Resources Institute and the Rocky Mountain Institute um, in conjunction actually with Center for Energy and Environment locally to look at it. But we are really looking at sort of maximizing out um, our efforts around um, solar energy, we're look, I mean, our, our renewable energy. The city is looking at a lot of interesting things about how we might be able to acquire energy to, for the entire um, uh, city and all of its businesses. Um, we still have you know, Renewable Connect and some of these other components like that. Um, this is the number that we think we can get to maximizing out on-site solar energy in the city of Minneapolis. So it's a, it's a pretty big number in there, um, but uh, we've, we have uh, a study that looks at all of the city's rooftops and available space um, for solar energy in over 10 years. We are very dedicated to making that happen. Um, so this is one of our top priorities. It's also part of our Bloomberg plan to come up with a, a, a solar strategy for the city. Yes? I, so if it's a top priority, you know, where are the solar incentives? You know, increasing funds for things like solar? Um, we are actively working on that on a legislative basis. Um, we have been very active in um, doing a, a low income solar rewards, which just started this year that provides um, uh, a one and a half dollar uh, fifty per kilowatt, I'm sorry, dollar fifty per watt um, upfront payment. Um, we also have dedicated through the franchise fee this year one and a half million dollars through our green business cost share program 
which is available to people to put rooftop solar on. We funded just last year six megawatts of solar through that green cost share program. So we, are look, we, we do have a number of incentives that are out there that we're working on right now. One of them that's really great that you might want to consider for if you're looking at a, um, a home putting it on, on rooftop is that uh, Solar United for neighbors is doing a, a um, cooperative um, solar effort right now, as well as the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. And both of those organizations, they had about 20 to 30 folks, uh, homeowners that got together and they, you know, jointly decide on a, a um, solar installer and the type of panels and the price and all that stuff. And those are eligible for our green business cost share. So we actually have provided incentives directly to homeowners through that particular uh, program. We're hoping to be able to ex expand that effort. I mean, right now we, we don't have a tremendous amount of money to work. Sounds like a lot, $2.8 million but in franchise fee money, but it's not a, a huge amount. So we have spread it out on a lot of different efforts. And what would you suggest? The reason why I ask is because, you know, historically with Made in Minnesota plus solar rewards, you know, we were supposed to have $25 million through like 2023. Right. And now last year, of course, you know, we scrapped made in Minnesota, mm -hmm. went down to 21 million. Mm -hmm. And this year we have 10 million with a, with a carve out, which means that 8 million is only accessible mm -hmm. to anybody who's not doing you know, the loan. So okay. so, yeah. And so I'm just wondering, you know, 25 to 21 to 8, you know, what's next year going to look like if yeah. we have such aggressive goals? Right. Well, I can tell you, we were the, the city was not supportive of that those reductions. And personally, I I was the manager of the Maine Minnesota program for the Department of Commerce, so I was not happy. They eliminated my job there. Actually, um, <laughs> we fought aggressively against it. I mean, Excel is wanting to eliminate community solar gardens. They may say they're not, but there's a lot of push to get rid of it. Um, they they are fighting at the legislature, saying that rooftop and and community solar gardens are way too expensive. We should do it utility scale. But last year, 90% of all solar capacity in the state of Minnesota was done outside of uh, Excel's involvement, basically individuals and community solar garden developers. That's where it was coming. Only 10 megawatts of utility scale solar was built last year. And yet we were in the top 10 of total capacity being built in the state of Minnesota. So we, the city of Minneapolis is a very strong stance that we support. Um, a, a diffused way of getting solar and renewable energy into the community. And we really believe that you need to have a sort of three part strategy. One, individuals and businesses being able to be an incentivized to, to do solar on their homes. Two, for those who don't have good solar access, the ability to access community solar type gardens through subscriptions. And three, aggressive renewable energy standards that pursue large scale, that sort of push the utilities to do large scale utility. But we'll continue to push hard on bringing incentives. And I'll tell you, we will be at the legislature asking next year, that's part of our legislative agenda for 2020, an extension past 2021 for solar rewards. And if we can keep the House and maybe get the Senate, we'll have a very good chance of doing that. But we all need to work together on stuff like that. Yeah. So when you renegotiated with Excel, what was it, two, three years ago, and it was a look at making it a municipal entity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where was the push? Where was the stick to tell Excel, if we renegotiate re re with you, you will push community solar. You will not not just all, you know individual solar. I mean, they've been to Washington, D.C. as the poster child for renewable energy. Yeah. They're getting all this good press. But right. in reality, it's that they're, walk they're, they're talking it, but they aren't walking. Right. No, I agree with you. I mean, we try, the only way that we really have to, to hold them to it is, is that we have an agreement to work together and, and they are um, voting on an agreed to shared work plan, which does include aggressive goals on, on renewable energy. Um, they are part of this 100% blueprint component and they need to, and they know that. Um, their solution is we'll take care of it for you, we'll get, get you into Renewable Connect and, and that kind of thing. Our biggest pushback is that we want local, we want additive, not just moving renewable energy credits around between different facilities. We want more on, on, the, uh, on the grid. And we also want to, we feel that we shouldn't have to be paying a premium for renewable energy anymore. So those are our top three principles and we've really worked through our system 
that we have in this partnership. But I can tell you certain council, we have a partnership meeting on Monday and we had a meeting with the council member representatives and the mayor yesterday and um, they're feeling kind of frustrated because we've been on a couple of different fronts have been sort of <laughs> gotten a lot of pushback. So there'll be an aggressive <laughs> commentary from the mayor actually on Monday. Yes. Um, question about <clears throat> with the diversification of our community, mm -hmm. with immigrant communities, with the struggle for affordable housing, is there kind of a plan or a philosophy about how do we integrate those components mm -hmm. of the urban living environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with reaching these goals? Yeah. And are they resonant goals? Mm -hmm. with those communities. You know, I mean, one of the things that we've been, it's a struggle, I will tell you. It's not, it's not easy um, to bring folks to the table who have been marginalized for generations. Um, there's not a lot of trust there um, with the city. Um, but it, it, we, we, are, we are working at it. I have a, we have a really good staff person who is really dedicated to, to helping facilitate discussions and rebuild trust. and take the time and has patience to work with folks and they're working on their own plans their work plans that's our green zone initiatives and I, we do have i have a couple of slides on that but that is where we're trying to to really bring in communities of color underrepresented communities native american communities and um it's an effort that we're focused on we have a someone who's dedicated 80 percent of their time to that effort and the programs that we do, like our Green Business Cost Share, um, gives in, uh, added incentives for um, d uh, renewable energy development in that area. Um, the city of Minneapolis is working with MRES, uh, as you probably know, on a, on a low-income community solar garden being built on a, a new facility up in um, the uh, northeast Minneapolis. We're proposing to do that at Hiawatha in south Minneapolis as well. And part of that, we have agreements to do energy efficiency at no cost within the green zone communities. And um, those folks will then get those subscriptions, which will dramatically reduce their energy costs and their overall energy burden. And we continue to try to scale that up. But it is, it is, it's, it's, it's time consuming, it's difficult. Um, it's not all communities of color just come together, you know, Somalians and Hmong and whatever, just like, oh yeah, we'll get together. There is a whole pr sort of, you know, process it takes to bring diverse communities together. And, but we're committed to continuing to work on it. We don't have all the answers, quite honestly. Yeah. Do the numbers in your chart here account for an increased load from electric cars and electrified heat and the other electrification stuff going on? Is this static current load? This, this is, that's an excellent question. And that's, this, this is actually gonna be updated, but for that exact reason. This does not have a dynamic um, look at energy efficiency and where we're at, 10 to 30%. It does not include um, uh, different scenarios for uh, uh, electrification or EV adoption. This looks at sort of a, here's where we are. In 2030, we're gonna have a very similar look. What would it take to be able to get to that 100% renewable? But we are working with RMI and WRI on a, doing what we're trying to develop is what's called a wedge analysis that looks at all of these in a big wedge. Each one of these would be a wedge. So if this went down, how much would that have to go up? And if this wasn't met or this wasn't met, how much would this, this have to go up? So we're trying to see where we can, the push pull on it, um, but we will be looking at different um, penetrations, different efficiencies and different electrifications because we have, uh, <coughs> we have the city council and the mayor are very committed to moving towards electrification in new buildings especially and also doing deep energy retrofits um, so it doesn't include it now but it's an excellent question all right i'm just going to zip through the, this is a lot <laughs> a chart that i normally don't put up but it actually is the chart that came from um, excel that shows um, uh, some of the the, the amount of um, on-site solar that we have and the total cost and capacity and that kind of thing it's a little bit in depth here. I know we're about five minutes behind. So um, I'm just gonna whip through that. But one of the things I wanted to mention here, which is kind of interesting is we've got a number of programs. This gives you just a comparison of where we could be relative now granted Denver, Fresno, Honolulu probably have a lot more sunshine. But this is the number of watts um, per capita of installed solar capacity. 
Honolulu is at 606. We're at 24. But look at this. Denver is at 330. So we got a long way to go. We got a lot of opportunity here is like what I like to say. Um, but you know, we do have some barriers. We have a very high cost of installation because of some, and we can have these guys talk all day about that. Um, we have some fairly high costs here. Um, it is not something that's consistently supported. We've had the start stop of made in Minnesota and all different kinds of things. We don't have a good residential PACE program. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do here to get um, our, our numbers up as, and we have a lot of, that means we have a lot of, lot, a lot of opportunity yet to go as far as the amount of um, solar um, in, this, in the city. This is a really cool concept that we're pursuing now and with a number of, of developers. Um, this is a passive house um, concept. It has been around for a long time, but we're hoping to be able to bring, my goal is to be able to bring this as the standard for housing development starting about, well, 2022 uh, in three years. We're doing a pilot program with a dozen different homes. These homes are extremely resilient through very high energy efficiency standards. They do not have any uh, utility or natural gas in them. Um, they basically never can get over, they never go over about 85 degrees and never drop below 55 degrees. So they can um, be run with the minimalist of power at the, at the least, they're 80% more efficient than the standard home that is built right now. They potentially can be 100% um, carbon neutral um, through these l large areas. They do continuous insulation, air tightness, thermal bridging, elimination, mechanical heat recovery, extremely um, uh, tight and efficient and clean indoor air quality. Um, so we're going to be rolling out a, a pilot program uh, with PPL and uh, the City of Lakes Community Land Trust this summer. Upper Harbor Terminal, I mentioned that. Um, one of the big things that I've been pursuing on this is an integrated utility hub, which utilizes uh, storm water and sewer wastewater uh, as, and for heat recovery. Um, it will capture and actually treat the water from about 75 square blocks around here. And before it goes into the Mississippi or back into the Metropolitan um, Council sewer treatment system, being able to produce electricity, um, heat, cooling all on site um, with no natural gas and no additional electricity other than being coming from the integrated utility hub. That's our, our district energy and uh, community solar model. Great stormwater management. We've also were able to get in the concept plan the approval of what's called the B3 standards, which are pretty aggressive sort of like uh, lead standards, which look at many different categories for environmental sustainability. I really want this to be a shining example of what our future can hold, and so we're going to be pursuing that quite hard. We have um, doing a lot on EVs. We have a big pilot to uh, electrify all 1,700 uh, uh, vehicles in the city fleet. We're actually the other thing we're doing with that is we're actually going through a complete analysis of how cars are used in order to reduce the number of cars that we actually have. And right now, we've been able to identify in the first 300 vehicles and how they're used, the ability to eliminate about a third of them. So we don't, it's like efficiency first, right? You don't need to have renewable energy, as much renewable energy if you reduce the amount of energy you're using. We don't need to have as many of these, even EV cars built, if we can have more people using them. And we change slightly our shift around a little bit. So we're looking at that. And then we're also looking at smart charging stations here so that we're able to, um, uh, identify because of demand response, um, identify when renewable energy is being produced and use that as a signal for charging for our EVs. Um, Plant-based diets, another whole big thing, the mayor's big on this. Um, you could reduce your, your carbon footprint by 15% as an individual by going meatless two days a week. The meat industry is very carbon intensive. <laughs> Patrick's ready to jump on that one right now. Um, but anyway, Mayor Fry signed a proclamation saying, you know, consider a plant-based diet. Um, it's a, it is a big factor um, in our carbon emissions. Community solar gardens, I mentioned we have great things going on there. And then here's our green zones. I know we're totally out of time. So, But green zones are really designed to be a place-based policy initiative aimed at improving health and supporting economic development using environmentally conscious efforts in communities that have faced the cumulative effects of environmental pollution as well as social, political, and economic vulnerability. This is a, 
a really great program. We've got some really neat um, things. This is the areas that we're talking about. Um, this little fun area over here goes over to Edison High School where it's actually a really cool environmental learning lab. Um, the Upper Harbor Terminal is actually right in here um, in that area. Um, so we've been doing some really great stuff. This is, as I mentioned, our we're not doing transactional things. We're trying to do community transformational things, not trying to build something new, but really trying to change the way that we do things. Um, we target our resources here, and we look for ways that we can system change rather than um, just basically say, oh, for this RFP, we might do some other priority. It's a broader, much broader vision for how we can do system change. Um, I mentioned uh, um, the green zones, and this is another unique program that we're looking at at Little Earth, um, which is we're part of a pilot program with the Urban Sustainability Directors Network and working with our Office of Emergency Management to basically do a deep energy retrofit for all homes in the Little Earth community. Um, and as part of that, taking their community center, which is used every day by many, many, many members, and creating a resiliency hub, basically a hub that's gonna be um, utilize uh, solar and battery storage um, and one that is going to be basically a part of education and training about how um, if there is a need, if there is some kind of a grid failure or other kind of tornado or emergency, this will be the place that people can go to receive assistance, to be charging phones, to seek, to seek shelter. This will be a, a hardened building um, and will basically be able to operate um, continuously without any connection. It will be a, a microgrid design for that building that we're doing at the community center. So that's our, our, one of our big resiliency components. If this is successful, we are looking at creating resiliency hubs throughout um, the city, working with um, ex established community-based organizations who are working on other things in the community, because this is really meant to be a there in the once every whatever 10-year emergency situation but we want it to be part of an overall education about sustainability, resiliency, awareness about that kind of thing, and be available there knowing that we're gonna have um, a lot of uh, adaptation needed to take on some of the, the challenges that climate change might bring. So, very quickly, just telling you what some things you can do that's pretty easy. Think about transit, riding a bike, car sharing, and driving an EV. Our car is committed to uh, transforming all 60 of their car shares to electric this year. So if you're part of an uh, 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 our car program, you'd be driving an electric car, which is really great. Um, shop at local farmers markets. Um, it really dramatically reduces the carbon footprint from transportation and you're really supporting our local economy. Um, as I mentioned, the enjoy a, a plant-based diet twice a week can reduce your carbon emissions by 15%. Insulate your home. If you, if you haven't insulated your home, that has the opportunity to reduce your energy use by 30% air sealing and insulation. Install rooftop solar or participate in a community solar garden. And you know, one of the things that's really important, and I know you are kind of speaking to the choir here with this group, but think about people that you know and bring up climate change and tell them why it's important to you. Um, it's really important. We, we have a lot of support within the city and metro area around it, but greater Minnesota we constantly run into pushback on all kinds of stuff. It's very visible at the legislature, but it's also very visible between how things are voted on and, and stuff like that, the federal government as well too. So one of the things that was so powerful about the ability to, to defeat the um, bill, the constitutional amendment against gay marriage is that it wasn't done through massive social media, billboards, advertising, whatever, it was done through one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, conversations about why it's important to you, why it's important to me that this not be passed. And that's what we need to do on climate change too, because this is an all-in strategy. If you think that the young people are gonna save the planet, <laughs> we gotta all be working together to save the planet on this, you know? So it's, that's really important, and I think it's really important to talk to people about why climate change is important to you. So there it is. That's it. Sorry, it's a lot of long stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs>